Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this evening and for your word. Um, I pray, Father, that as we, we open it here tonight and we consider this, this most central concept, this most central characteristic to who you are, Lord, I pray that you would give me grace to do it justice. I pray, Lord, for, um, for your grace to be bestowed upon this group. That you would manifest yourself to us and, and um, peel off some of the layers of, of your heart of who you are. Um, I just I really pray for a special work of your Holy Spirit tonight as we as we consider your grace in Jesus name, Amen. So what is grace? Um, I'm going to start out with this question, just reading something from um, from John MacArthur that I really agree with what he says here. Grace is a terribly misunderstood word. Defining it succinctly is notoriously difficult. Some of the most detailed theological textbooks do not offer any concise definition of the term. Someone has proposed an acronym, GRACE, is God's Riches at Christ's Expense, G-R-A-C-E, God's Riches at Christ's Expense. Um, You've probably heard that. I heard that a lot, particularly in Bible college. That's not a bad way to characterize grace, but it is not a a sufficient theological definition, and I really agree with them because grace is far... Though God's riches at Christ's expense is kind of a cute way of remembering one of the key aspects of grace, grace is actually far more than that. One of the best-known definitions of grace is only three words, God's unmerited favor. A.W. Tozer expanded on that, and he said, Grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits on the undeserving. Burkhoff is more to the point. Grace is... Quote, the unmerited operation of God in the heart of man affected through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Un- end quote. Grace is not merely unmerited favor, and I agree with him here as well, because um, John MacArthur was a little bit on a rant when he was writing this, but I really agree. He's, there's a lot of cheap grace. Earlier in this article that he was writing, he was quoting Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, when D- Dietrich Bonhoeffer is actually the first one to have coined the terms cheap grace as he was talking about it. And basically, they were, Bonhoeffer was saying, in his day, and it's hard, it's hard to imagine there wasn't a day, I guess, when you think about that in Bonhoeffer's day and age, in Nazi Germany, and in some part of the time that he was in New York before going back to Nazi Germany, before he later being hung, um, that Bonhoeffer talked about cheap grace, that these people, that they basically believed that God's grace was universalism, and that he was so gracious that everybody was just going to be forgiven, and it was this kind of widespread universalism without any strings attached or anything like that. And so he coined this idea of cheap grace. Um, <clears throat> the unmerited of operate. Oh, sorry, I already read that line. Grace is not merely unmerited favor. It is favor bestowed on sinners who deserve wrath. Showing kindness to a stranger is unmerited favor. However, doing good to one's enemies is more to the spirit of grace. And I like what he says there, because that's really true. Thus, we could properly define grace as, and this is MacArthur's definition, the free and benevolent influence of a holy God operating sovereignly in the lives of undeserving sinners. And I I like what he says there, um, adding the connotation of the idea of of sinners. So, what is grace? Before we get into talking about, I, if I remember correctly, I think I have seven. I have seven um, facets of grace, but before we get into those seven facets of grace, I want to just really quickly um, consider a, a handful of aspects of God's grace, because there's a difference here. Um, af, as I was kind of studying some of these 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 writings about grace, it it was it became quite clear, especially when you study a lot of the modern writings by universalists who don't call themselves universalists, and they just believe that, um, you know, everybody's forgiven, everybody falls under God's grace, and so um, God's grace is just this kind of ambiguous, vague thing, that it it really, there is a problem there, and so there are um, a handful of aspects I want to consider, And, and the first is this, is that God's grace has a purpose. If you're taking notes, this is a big one, this is very important. God's grace is not some vague cloud of 
goodwill toward humankind in some sort of non-individual way where everybody just falls under the love of God and so everybody's going to um, face the same fate at the end of time, at the end of their lives. God's grace has a purpose, and we see this in the book of Ruth, and we see it throughout Scripture, that God actually shows grace for a reason. And this is important. Um, <clears throat> in the book of Ruth, the, the, the epitome of the reason is actually portrayed for us. Boaz is graceful to Ruth, as we're going to kind of delve into some of the ways that he shows grace to her, and he manifests God's grace through the book. Um, but I don't want to kind of bleed into those points, but I do want to say this. The purpose Boaz showed her grace is because he wanted a relationship with her. And God's grace towards mankind has a purpose. It is not purposeless. It is not just some vague general operation of, of goodwill toward mankind. That's, that's, not his, that's not what his grace is. Um, that actually, to be honest, makes grace something else, but that's a, for a whole other teaching, when you, you just give grace blanketly um, to all people, because at some point, then you have to say, really, he's going to give Hitler grace? Great. Hitler's going to be, Hitler's not going to face judgment for the things he's done? And so there, there comes a problem when you just kind of make this vague generalization. But it has a purpose, and the purpose was to bring us into relationship with him. And so it's very important to understand um, that there was a purpose for his grace. Secondly, grace has a cost. And it's truly a shame that many people today, um, even Christians, even myself at times in my Christian experience, I'm sure you've experienced this too, that I didn't value grace, I didn't value God's grace enough, basically because it was given to me freely. It was given to me free of charge. And I think about a story I read about somebody who, who bought um, some knick-knack at a, at a garage sale and they were letting their kids play with it and the kids were kind of being rough with it and stuff and they had no idea because they only paid a couple dollars for this knick-knack they had no idea that the knick-knack they had purchased for a couple dollars was actually worth millions of dollars and they later found out because a friend noticed it and was like hey that's not really just an average doll do you know that you know and, and it and I think we are like that with grace because it was given so freely to us we can sometimes, many Christians, um, can fail to apprehend the true cost that grace had. And that kind of touches on that point where it is God's riches for us at Christ's expense. Thirdly, grace has a condition. Grace has a condition. And we've talked about this. I'm not going to beat any of these points to death. I just think they're necessary. Grace has a condition. Like God's love has a condition. And I've talked about this before. We've talked about the fact that... Um, <clears throat> there's been a teaching that's permeated the modern church um, and it's called um, the unconditional love of God and it's not biblical it's flat out not biblical I've heard most if not all of the, the, the people I respect in the Christian faith say it at one point or another it was so popular 20 or 30 years ago um, I've heard Billy Graham talk about it I've heard and I've heard just about everybody that I respect because it sounds so right. And there is a form of it that's correct, but generally speaking, it's not true. God's love is not unconditional. It is conditional. All love is conditional. Josh and Sydney's love in their marriage is conditional. Alicia's and my marriage is conditional. That's what the marriage ceremony is all about. Do you promise to take her in sickness and in health? Oh, conditions to be faithful. Even if she gets paralyzed in a car accident or, or he gets all messed up and is no longer um, attractive, you, you are promising to love them. And those are conditions to be faithful. God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes shall not perish. A condition. A condition. And here's the thing. This is why we find ourselves in this late hour in a place where Christians, people calling themselves Christians, and most of culture have this vague concept of God's grace that it's going to all wash out, man. It's going to be okay. God's love is unconditional. No, 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 it's not. His love is extremely conditional, actually. His love is predicated on, on faith, on repentance, on confession. It's predicated upon those things. There are conditions. Now, here is the truth. 
As we've talked about before, God's love is conditionally unconditional. For his child, his love is unconditional. If you have given your life to Christ and you have gotten saved and been born again, you are his child and his love for you is unconditional. There's nothing you could do as his child that would change his love for you. In the same way, it doesn't matter what one of my children could do, no matter how heinous their crime, how premeditated their crime, as a father, I'm still going to love them. They're my child. Now, if my neighbor goes and commits the same crime, <laughs> not going to be the same feelings there. My love for my neighbor, sorry, frankly, is, is not unconditional. And God's love for the, for the person who is rejecting his will for their life is, is conditional. His love is conditional. And this concept here is that, that grace has a condition. Fourthly, grace has death. The second Peter 3.18 says it's possible to grow in the grace of God. So there's grace that's given for salvation. There's grace given to sustain you. Um, grace is multifaceted, but it is deep. Grace is deep. It's something that we are to grow in the grace of God. So without any further ado, let's, let's hop into these seven facets of the grace of God. <clears throat> one of the things that's, that's kind of lightly touched in the book of Ruth, firstly, is the condescension of the grace of God, the condescension. The first facet of the grace of God that I'll consider, that I would consider is the condescension. It's inescapable in the book of Ruth for you to um, miss the fact that Boaz is a mighty, ma- a wealthy, strong man of valor. And Ruth is not wealthy. She's not really strong. She is one of the weakest members of society. And there is a condescension in Boaz's attraction to Ruth. There is a condescension in his, his, his pursuit of Ruth and his action on her behalf to become her kinsman redeemer. There is a condescension there. And this strikes at one of the main facets of the grace of God, and that is this concept called the the kenosis. Now, in Philippians 2, you can turn there if you want, you don't have to, I'll read it to you. In Philippians 2, 5 through 11, there's a very important passage and a very, very important word, a word so important they actually had a one of those third or fourth century church councils all about this one word, actually. Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Now, what is that saying there? Quite frank, quite simply, what it's saying is that Jesus, before he was born as the babe of Bethlehem, was the form of God, and it was not robbery for him to have called himself God because he was God. So Paul is basically poetically saying... Jesus is God, okay? (laughs) He's going about it in a roundabout poetical way, but he's saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's not saying that you you should not consider it robber to be equal God. That's not what he's talking about. He's first poetically establishing Christ's position as God at the height of who he is, and he's saying, let this mind be in you, that Christ, who it wouldn't have been robbery for him to have considered himself equal with God, because he was God, Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself to the and he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God. But made himself of no reputation. That's translated in some of the versions as emptied himself. It's the Greek word kinu or kinosis. And this word was actually a word of very heavy debate because it had to do with the Gnostic um, heresy and whether or not Jesus actually was God. And their whole point was the word kinu means he emptied himself of his attributes of God, but he did not empty himself of who he was, he just emptied himself of his powers. And this is a very important truth about when Jesus lived on the earth, the things he did that appeared 
to make him God, like controlling the wind and the waves and, and setting the captives free and, and, and healing people and, and casting out demons, those were not done out of his godhood. This is very important because this word kinu, this concept of him emptying himself, it's the concept of kind of like saying he came to earth with both his arms tied behind his back. He emptied himself of his divine power, but he could not, you cannot empty yourself of yourself, though. You can't change, you can't empty yourself of yourself because you would be something else. And this concept, that's basically what they were arguing about. But here's the deal. He condescended to become one of us. And this is one of those truths that's very hard to get your head around. And I always struggle to get my head around it until I heard um, an illustration told by one of my favorite Bible teachers, and it's, it's fantastic. He said, so suppose, Josh, at the, end of, at the end of the age, you know, everyone in here that's a believer, we, we all stand before God, and, and you get your chance, and you stand before Jesus, and he says, hey, Josh, I want to show you something. You're like, really, me? He's like, yeah, you. I, I really want to show you something. Come with me. And he, in the blink of an eye, he's taking you to the other side of the, of the universe, to a galaxy that we didn't even know existed, and he, you zoom into a planet, and he shows you this planet, and he says, check this planet out. And in a moment, you can see down in the planet, you can see that the planet is a beautiful planet, and it's like Earth, and it's populated with biological creatures like Earth is, and there's a dominant race of biological creatures on the planet, and they're dogs. But they're intelligent dogs, and they can talk, and they feel, and they write, and they sing, and they make music, and they create technology, and he says to you, he says, isn't this incredible? And you're like, dude, I'm a dog lover. This is really amazing. This is, good job, you know, good job, Lord. <laughs> so he's like, he says, he says, yeah, it's pretty awesome. He said, I really, I really love all these, these, these creatures down here, um, but there's a problem. Look a little closer, and as you look a little closer, you realize that all these creatures, they're actually snarling at one another, and they're fighting, and they can't live in peace, and they're devouring one another, and he says, I love them, but they're lost. They are stuck in their sinful ways in the same way that earth was stuck in their sinful ways, and you're like, oh, man, okay, that's kind of a bit of a bummer, you know, and he says, Josh, what do you think about um, maybe going down there and, and, and giving them pretty much the same message that, that I, I gave on earth, and, and you're sort of going, oh, um, okay, and he says, well, hold on, they're going to reject you, and like they reject, like the humans on earth rejected me, and eventually crucified me, they're going to do the same thing to you, but don't worry about it, on the third day you'll rise from the dead, and you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> um, okay, uh, I love you, I, I'm, I'm open to this, I think, and he said, but there's one more catch, and this is, the, this is the clincher. You have to become a dog. He says, not only do you have to become a dog, you're going to be a dog for eternity. Do you guys understand the condescension of Christ? He was not always a human or God in a human form. And there is something we have missed, many of us, in the condescension of Christ, that when he became a man, apparently from everything we can see in Scripture... He became a man eternally. For eternity, God, the whatever, the second or third member of the God, I can't remember the stupid rank that people place things and they go to seminaries and create fancy words and stuff. Jesus, one of the members of the Godhead, became, put himself in human form for eternity in his condescension for us. A heavy, heavy truth in his grace. Secondly, Grace is favor. It's not completely summed up in the concept of favor, but grace is favor. I had a, a good friend. His name was Chris Tompkins. It's possible that one or two of you might know him. He was a, he was a, a local, he was a kid who was my age when we were kids. <laughs> he had graduated from FIT. I think he was getting the same degree Shaw's getting, actually. Um, and, but he was really heavily involved in missions, and we did some mission trips to the Bahamas with him, and one of the things I really liked about Chris, because we, we did a couple, Alicia and I did a couple different mission trips with him to the Bahamas, is um, he said favor a lot. Um, like when something would go right, he'd be like, dude, favor, man. God just showed us favor, you know? And it was cool. It really, it really stuck with me because 
you know, where other people would be like, oh, I'm blessed, you know, or oh, what a blessing. And he'd be like, favor, man. He'd be like, or he'd be like, most people would be like, God showed us grace. He'd be like, God gave us favor. And I really liked that because it's, it's a word that we've really dropped from our vernacular, um, from our Christian vernacular, but there's a truth to it. A big part of grace is favor. And in the book of Ruth, Boaz showed Ruth incredible favor. You guys, we're not going to go into the verses. We really don't have time to get into every single verse. Um, but in Ruth 2.2 2, and then Ruth 2.15-16, through 16, Boaz shows favor to Ruth. There are four commands, essentially, that he gives to the young men working in the field on Ruth's behalf. He says, don't touch her. Let her glean in the sheaves, which was not, which was against the law. You guys, if you guys understand that law and how it worked, God had enacted a law in Israel as a form of social security that a farmer who owned a property could glean it once, and he could, and he wasn't allowed to glean it twice, and he wasn't allowed to glean the corners, and then the poor and the destitute of the land could come in after the. The, the reapers and pick up anything that had fallen on the ground and they could glean they could glean along the edges of the field where they weren't allowed to. It was God's social security system. So Boaz is saying to these young men, his reapers, he's saying, don't you dare touch her. <laughs> and then he also says, hey, if she kind of gets out ahead of you a little bit and kind of walks into the sheaves a little bit that haven't been reaped, don't say a thing to her. <laughs> Let her do it. If she accidentally gets gets ahead of you guys and and goes out of where she's allowed to glean. He says, thirdly, do not reproach her if she does that. Fourthly, he says, let, and we talked about this to some degree, and um, John Corson has a really good teaching about this verse, uh, let fall some vessels of purpose or some vessels on purpose for her. So four commands of favor that he commands his young men in the field to show her favor, to to not touch her, to to give provision, and basically to be gracious to her, to be kind and merciful to her. And here's the truth. As believers, we, the, the system is rigged in our favor. The system is rigged in your favor. Favor, by nature of what it is, is not fair. Grace is not fair. Favor is not fair. And we talked a week or two ago about how there is a tremendous fairness in the overarching uh, concept of God dealing with man, but this is one of those sub parts of it where favor isn't fair. And the world is, even though you may not feel like it at this moment, the world is rigged in your favor. And some of you might be like, well, I don't really feel like that right now, Chris. Actually, I haven't felt like that in a really long time, actually, that the world's rigged in my favor. Can I tell you guys that there are, some, there are some general favor that God gives you that you can take for granted? Do you know he's promised, he's promised to put a roof over your head and provide for you and to give you clothing. He has promised that. He has, de take, he has defeated death, kicked the devil's teeth in, and said, you can't have my children, you can't have a single ounce, you can't have a single foot of property in my children's lives without them giving you permission. He has given us incredible favor. He has told the enemy, you cannot touch them beyond what they give you property, beyond what he will at times allow in our lives. He has given us incredible favor. I love this thing that Robbie Zacharias said as he was kind of unpacking one of these truths about God's favor in the Christian. He talked about how for the non-believer, pain is, a, is the central aspect of their life, and joy is a peripheral experience. And he talked about for the believer that joy is central and pain is peripheral. And I don't know if that's your experience, but it's been my experience. For a very long time, for 10 to 12 years of, my, of the last 10, maybe 15 years of my Christian life, the central experience of my life has been joy and peace and goodness. Yeah, there's been pain on the peripheral. There's been pain, at times deep pain. But there is joy at the center of my experience. For the non-believer, pain, emptiness is the, at the center of their experience. That's why they have so many songs about the weekend, about the peripheral of life. 
life is baneful and pointless until Friday afternoon. And then we party till Sunday afternoon, at which point the walls close in and we have to go back to the real world for the majority of our life. Pain is central. Emptiness is central for the non-Christian. And joy is something that they experience peripherally. But for the believer, joy is central. And here's the rub of this. There are people in here, I don't doubt it, that you're balking at what I'm saying right now because that hasn't been your experience as a Christian. Can I tell you, there's probably something wrong with your Christian experience then. I'm not saying that life is always going to be easy. Life is always going to be free of disappointments or heartaches or struggles. You'll have them. You'll have seasons of loss. But in the grand scheme of things, I've had seasons of loss. You guys who've known me for a while, you know. You know. We've had seasons of loss. But they're peripheral. And even in the seasons of loss, I have found joy. I love it. I keep talking to David, and and some of you know his current situation. Now, he's going through a season of loss. And he keeps telling me, he's like, dude, but I just have a peace for you. You are experiencing this right now, that even in, in a season of painful loss, joy is still central. And maybe it's even more central than you've experienced before. That's been my experience. It's actually in those seasons of loss that I, I actually find, the, I found the joy. And, and it's that one of those truths of the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story about how they're, they're, the ropes that were binding them were actually burned up in the furnace, not them. And you experience in your life that even those seasons of loss, of pain, that they served a purpose to actually set you free and to, to let joy reign more thoroughly in your life and centrally in your life. And I've heard Christians, and I haven't said this in a long time, but I was at a point, one of the, those Christians who said this, man, it's hard to be a Christian. It's so hard to be a Christian. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's hard not to be a Christian. I remember what it was like not to be a Christian. For the person who's walking through life as, and they think they're a Christian, and they go, man, it's just so hard to be a Christian. I really want to be out there doing my thing in the world. And I tell you, God might say, okay, prodigal, go. Quit pretending like you want to be here. You're going to find out what hard really is. Go out in the world. Listen to this passage, and let's see if you ever caught one of the interesting truths about it. Mark 4 says this, 35 through 41. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But then he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Did you notice in verse 36 that there were other little boats on the sea? You want to know what's hard in life? It's when the windstorm comes, when you're out on the sea and it comes for everyone and Jesus isn't in your boat. That's what's hard. That's truly hard because the, the pain, the loss, comes to all mankind. Everybody is born separated from God. Everybody is born destined to die destined to live a life that in one way or another has pain surrounding it. And I'll tell you what's hard. What's hard, what I've learned through years of experience, what's hard is not having Jesus in the boat. That was hard in my teenage years, the three or four years that I was incredibly depressed, and I would call out for a reprieve from the depression and the emptiness, and nothing nothing happened. There was no answer. There was no there was no reprieve. There was no comfort. I called out even to the Christian God, even though I wasn't a Christian, and I got nothing. Just more emptiness. That was hard. That was hard not having Jesus in my boat. With Jesus in my boat, every single time I've really cried out with a broken heart, with a with an overwhelmed heart, every 
single time in the last 20 years he has answered. It may have seemed like he was sleeping, <laughs> like the storm was out of control and he didn't know what was going on and I, it seemed like I had to wake him up or something. I don't know why that was. He was testing me, but he was there. He was in my boat. And when I cried out to him with a broken or an overwhelmed heart, he was there. I think about the first time it happened. I was thinking about how I was, later that summer, I was going to have to go to an event and there were going to be people there who I had hurt when I was a non-Christian. And I was a Christian and I was no longer depressed, but I was wringing my hands at night laying there going, I don't know what to do. I really don't want to go to this event. I'm going to have to face some people that I really hurt. And I was just getting super stressed, super bummed out and depressed. And then I, it occurred to me to call out to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, I, I don't know what to do about this. Would you please help me? And all of a sudden I was filled with peace. Which if I can convey to you that I had been in a very similar situation as a story of my life for about four years and cried out in a very similar way and nothing happened as a non-believer... And then the first time I did it as a believer, and I was filled with peace, and I felt like God was saying to my heart, it's going to be okay. Just trust me. You know what? It ended up being okay. And he gave me a peace that night, a peace that persisted the months up to the, this, this event that I had to go to. And I'll tell you the truth, as a believer, every single time I have cried out from a sincere heart, from a troubled heart, from a broken heart, from an overwhelmed heart, every single time I found that he actually was in the boat. He was in my boat. It's not hard, guys. It's hard. It, the human life at times is just hard. But it's not hard being a Christian compared to being a non-Christian. I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't trade it for a second. There's not a part of me at this point in my life that has any desire to go back, that thinks it's easier to be a non-believer. I can't imagine going through the things I've gone through with my family, the losses that we've experienced financially. I can't even imagine going through them as a non-believing man and feeling like the weight of my family's future was on my shoulders. Do you know what's gotten me through the, the financial losses we've gone through in recent years? It's knowing that he's in control. You know, you men know, you ladies know this in some way, that the way that it would feel to have the weight of your family's livelihood on your shoulders. You know what? I don't carry it. I haven't carried it through the losses. I'm not capable of carrying it. And in, even in the losses we've experienced, joy for me remained central. Pain was a peripheral experience. It's been a peripheral experience. But joy remained cent central. Can I tell you why? Because it's rigged in my favor. Life is rigged in my favor. It's been my experience. And if you're here tonight as a believer, and maybe you're a genuine believer, and you've been a believer for many years, and you're struggling at that concept, and you're balking at it, can, I, can you just hear me when I say it's been my experience? Maybe you should consider trusting the Lord with your whole life. Because that's very likely the thing that's... There's something very possibly keeping you from really experiencing the Christian life the way it's supposed to be experienced. Where joy is central no matter what you're going through. <clears throat> Thirdly, thirdly, looking at grace. Man, I could talk all night. God has given me so much favor. <laughs> I think about the time, I think about how Alicia and I got, I'm sorry, I, I won't go on long. I think about how when Alicia and I got married, we were obeying the Lord. I'm not saying you should get married when you're broke. <laughs> as a, as a, necessarily a, <laughs> um, a, a paradigm of how to do it. But we, we were broke. <laughs> I was mowing lawns, like not making any money. And she was working at a ser as a server at Olive Garden, making even, believe it or not, less money than me, which was pretty miraculous. And, but God was in us getting married, and we got married. And within a year, she got let go from her job and then ended up working at the job that now she's working at now. And it's been a blessing. She works from home. And I, I got called out of the blue by somebody and said, hey, you know, um, so this major telecommunications company is hiring. How would you like to make twice as much as you're making right now? And I'm just like, uh, hmm, let me think about it. <laughs> uh, hmm, let me pray for about five minutes, all right? I'll give you a call. <laughs> God has given us so much favor. It was great. We laughed. We laughed. We laughed because within a year of us getting married, we both were in jobs that were paying twice as much as we have when we get. And I'm not saying that that's going to be your experience. 
But I'll tell you guys the truth. God has, God has given me so much favor. His, this grace, the grace that he showed that is clearly depicted in the book of Ruth, that Boaz showed her grace. Boaz rigged the field in her favor. God does that for you. And I know that if you haven't experienced that version of the Christian life, it is there for you to experience. And I challenge you to not harden your heart to that truth. <clears throat> Thirdly, giving. So grace, the first facet was condescension. The second facet was favor. The third facet of God's grace is giving. must have written down the wrong verse here, but Boaz gives to Ruth, as we clearly <clears throat> kind of saw with the favor that he showed her, and there's this interesting truth about what grace is. It's giving. And this, I don't think, I don't think anybody would argue with. This is one of the common understandings of grace, that it is giving. Now, 2 Chronicles 16.9 say, 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking out Seeking whom he may empower. <clears throat> I think I just quoted that. I didn't quote that entirely correctly. <laughs> Second Chronicles 16.9. Does anybody have it right in front of them? I got it. <laughs> For the eyes of the Lord went to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. There we go. For the eyes of the Lord went to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Now, it's been said by those who study such things, by people who study... Uh, philanthropy and, and, and the art of sealing deals and getting people to contribute, that there are three types of wealthy people in the world. Um, if you go and knock on, on people's doors and you, you find wealthy people and you go and knock on their door, you'll knock on some people's door and no matter how well you present your, your thing that you're trying to get them to take part in, they're not going to buy into it. And then there's the second part of wealthy people. If you knock on the door and you have a really, really good presentation, they might donate to it. They might give to it. But then there's this third kind of wealthy person. And this type of wealthy person is a philanthropist. They're actually out searching for causes that they can give to. And this is the issue. A lot of people think God is the first type of person. <laughs> that he's the, He is wealthy. He's got... The cattle on a thousand hills, he's got, he, there's, he has no lack. And, you know, my experience has been if I knock on his door and I present a really good case, it always gets shot down. You know, that's, that's, that's who they believe God is. Or they believe that, you know, maybe if you present a good enough case for this cause, he'll take part in it. Can I tell you guys that Second Chronicles 16.9 says he's the third type. He's actually searching the world for people that he can show himself strong on their behalf. He's actually searching. Now, this obviously ties in with the point before about favor. We've already talked about the fact that God favors his children, and he wants to favor believers, <clears throat> and he wants to give gifts. But so this raises, again, a, along the same lines, it raises an, an issue. It raises the question, well, why hasn't that been my experience? If he's out looking for people to bless, hey, I'm one of his children. Why am I not getting empowered? Why am I not receiving some of this? Well, it's important that you understand that this, like many of the truths in the Bible, has a condition on it. It has a condition. It says that he may show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So, <clears throat> we've got to look into this. James 4, if you want to turn there, you might as well spend a little bit of time here in James 4. This really ties in with the previous point. If you were saying in your heart, I'm not blessed. I'm not. I don't see God's favor in my life. Why is that? Uh, we're going to dissect this. There are four, um, five reasons given in James four why we ask and we have not, or why we have not. <laughs> Verse 
verse 3 says, you ask and you do not receive. So why? So starting in chapter 4, verse 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that warn your members? <coughs> you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses... Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, <clears throat> I actually have six, I remember. I remember my six of one now. <laughs> so the first reason that a believer has not, is not walking in the favor of the Lord is selfishness. If, if you look at your life and you go, I, I, that hasn't been my experience as a Christian, it's possible that there is a deep root of selfishness in your life and that God cannot bless that because in blessing your life while you persist stubbornly in one of these negative dynamics is is to is to basically approve of that negative dynamic and so he won't do it. So this this issue of selfishness we see it there in verses one through three. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that warn your members? You lust, you desire and do not have you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. So selfishness, there can be a root of selfishness. Secondly, it can be a lack of faith. And this is one of the keys. I think most Christians, we understand that selfishness is bad, and we try to, um, we try to forsake our selfishness. And, and, and I think that that's probably not the main one for most people. But this is the one that in my that I struggled with the most, and that I it seems very prevalent with believers. You have not because you don't ask. Some Christians literally don't ask. They don't ever ask to be blessed. They don't ever ask God to bless them. This was one of Chuck Smith's main things. He was like, I ask God to bless me every day. Now I, always, I have to be honest with you, I always struggled with that. I was like, um, that doesn't really sound like how a Christian could should think. Now, it wasn't Chuck's main thought every morning, like me, God bless me. You know, that wasn't his point. <laughs> that wasn't his point. But there is an engagement of faith that happens. There is an operation of faith that happens when we say, you know what, I'm God's child and he loves me. And I believe you do want to bless me. Lord, would you bless me today? Would you bless me this week? Would you do something on my behalf? Would you show me favor? Can I tell you that some of us, we have not because we ask not, because we don't believe. We don't truly believe that God loves us or is as good as he says he is. Thirdly, it can be a divided, an issue of divided loyalty. In verses 4 through 5, he says, There are adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now this is not really talking about just simply having friends who are non-Christians. That's not what it's saying. It's talking here the idea of being a friend of the world system. Let me harp on one aspect of this. Having been a youth pastor for so long, and this being a college group, and so this very pernicious concept can still in, um, seep into a college group that's more prevalent in a youth group. It's the issue of being cool. Being cool. Is there anything more worldly than the concept of being cool? Is there anything more worldly than that? Because it ties in the, the concept of pride, right? I am the best, or I'm going to be the best. It ties in the concept of possessions. Coolness always relies on possessions. It ties in the concept of hero worship or adoration of a being other than God. It is the sin that the devil fell into. He wanted to be adored in God's place. Okay, I challenge you, I challenge you to meditate on the wickedness of the cool factor. It is a wicked thing. And I, as a youth pastor, it was something that I 
absolutely did not put up with in the youth group. We didn't do this cool, we didn't allow a cool hierarchy with the kids. Anywhere we could, we saw it and we could do something about it, we stamped it out. That's the way the world does it. That's the way the world do, you know? That's, the, that's <laughs> their thing. And it has no place in the kingdom of God. To me, the, the, the idea of cool strikes at the very core of wickedness, of the mystery of lawlessness, of everything that is anti-God. How can you be a Christian and be cool? You can be cool among Christians, I guess, but to truly be cool as a Christian, you have to adhere to the world system, to the very core, to the very vileness of the, to the, of the very system that hates God. That's why you can't be cool and be a Christian. Because it, it's very core of what it is, it's anti-God. It's anti-everything he loves. So when it talks about here, friendship with the world, it is not talking about having non-believing friends. That's not at all. I think you guys understand that. It's talking about having strong allegiance to the world system in your heart. Is there still a root of coolness in anybody's heart? I'm not, don't raise your hands. <laughs> is there still a root there of that? Is it, because it, I'll tell you, it's, it's a massive stumbling block. It will eat up your spiritual life. It will keep you out of the blessing of God. It won't keep you from being his child. He still loves you. It says here, there, he, but he gives more grace. Verse 6, in the middle of all this very convicting stuff that James is saying, he says, don't lose heart, <laughs> even if this is you. He gives more grace. He's there to give you grace. That's true. But I will, I will tell you guys this. This, uh, this friendship with the world, the, the main place I see this in our generation, in our culture, is the cool thing. Is trying to be cool, wanting to be cool, wanting to be adored, wanting the love and a praise of man. That Christian who is who has that strong allegiance to that um, dynamic, that worldly dynamic, will never be powerfully used by the Lord because you care too much what people think to tell them the truth. You care too much what people think to step out of the lockstep of the world system in the direction that it's heading. And you have to understand that that system hates God. It hates God. And you cannot be a friend. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but if two people hate each other, it's pretty much impossible to be friends with both of them. It's pretty much impossible. It, it might be possible for about five or ten seconds <laughs> until somebody opens their mouth, but it's impossible to be friends with two people, strong friends with two people who hate each other. And God hates, with capital letters, the world system. And in my experience, it, it, there's nothing that that it um, embodies the world system more than that wicked concept of being cool. Divided loyalty there. Verse 6, pride. <clears throat> so these, these, these traits that will keep you out of the blessing of God are selfishness, faithlessness, divided loyalty, and here we find pride. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You want grace, you must humble yourself under God's hands. You must humble yourself before him. You must stop trying to do everything on your own. You must stop doing everything for yourself. You must humble yourself under his mighty hand, and he will give you grace. He will lift you up. Verse 7. Independence is this fifth one. Pride is the fourth. Independence is the fifth trait. Independence or self-dependence. There, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit to God. Not being submitted, being independent. Not ever praying and asking God's will. Not even being concerned about God's will for your life. Trying to live independently or self-dependently will keep you out of that that blessing, that, that place of favor. And then last, lastly, moving on, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near to God. The, the last, the sixth trait that will keep you out of the favor of God is, is ingenuineness. <laughs> I don't even know if that's a word. But being ingenuine, seeking God's hand instead of his face. 
Interesting that it makes this statement here at the end of this list where it says, therefore, draw near to him. You see, a lot of people draw near to him because they're seeking his hand. They want something from him. And so in the midst of a teaching like this where we're talking about grace and favor, don't, get the, the, don't make the mistake of saying, okay, I'm going to draw near to God so I can be blessed. That's ingenuine. The truth is, is that I have learned as a believer is that as I draw near to God, just to draw near to him because I love him and I can't do life without it, I find myself blessed as a sort of a, a, a result of it. But don't seek, don't seek him for his hand, you seek him for his face. So, fourthly, the fourth facet of grace. Man, we're not making good time. What is wrong with you people? You're slowing me down. Shocker. <laughs> well played. <clears throat> Ruth, chapter 2. This point won't take as long. <laughs> I don't have 12 sub points. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> I'm changing the points as we're going. I apologize for that. <laughs> All right. Something that was interesting as I was reading J. Vernon McGee's commentary on Ruth, he noticed something that I never noticed before. Um, in 2 verse 21, it says, Ruth the Moabitess said, she's speaking to Naomi here. She's coming from the field. Um, Naomi has noticed that she's got a, a, quite a large amount of grain for what she was doing. And she's like, hey, what's going on? And they're having this conversation. And um, Naomi kind of asks her what's going on, who the guy was, and, and what they said to each other. And so Ruth here is basically responding in verse 21. And she says, um, he also said to me, you shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. Have you ever noticed that that's not what he said? I actually never noticed that. Mm -hmm. That's not what he said. Yeah. In in 2 verse 8, what did he say? Stay away from the guys, go with the girls. Yeah, he said, girls. he told her, stay by my young women. Yeah. <laughs> I love this. J. Vernon McGee caught this. Listen to it now. So in 2 8, he told her to stay by his young women. She says to Naomi, he said, stay by the young men. <laughs> and Naomi said... To Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, <laughs> not the young men, and that people do not meet you in any other field. So, verse 23, she took her advice. She stayed close by the young women of Boaz. You'll notice in 2.8 it says, Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Interesting. Now, there was nothing wrong, there was nothing untoward going on, but she was a widow. She was probably hoping some point to get married. And this is interesting. This is, for, this is to me, points at the forbearing aspect of God's grace. This is the aspect of his grace that for the believer is at times most preeminent, that he forbears our fickleness. He is the forbearing one. He is the one who holds back his wrath. He said to the nation of Israel through the prophet Jeremiah, I am weary from holding my wrath back. It, it really shows his heart, doesn't it? That he loved them so much, he wanted to show them mercy, and he was giving them time to repent. And as a holy God, he had this giant fireball of wrath just waiting for them because his holiness demands it. And he's holding it back. And he said, I'm weary from holding my wrath back. The forbearing God. This reminds me, we don't have time, so we're not going to turn there, but you can check it out for yourself. How in Ruth, uh, sorry, in Luke 23, 39 through 43, how the one of the two thieves that was crucified with him says to him right before Jesus dies in the ninth hour, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus, you guys know those most famous words, today you will be with me. And most assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Do you know by chance what that thief was doing at the sixth hour? Mocking him. He was mocking him. Have you ever noticed 
that in Matthew 27, 44, both thieves that were crucified with him mocked him. Have you ever considered that? I challenge you this week, if you've got nothing better to do, meditate on that truth. Meditate on the truth that when Jesus turned to this guy next to him on the cross and said, most assuredly I say to you today you will be with me in paradise, that three hours earlier he was mocking him. He was mocking him. The forbearance of God is absolutely incredible. There is no love like it in the world. There is no mercy like it in the world. I, <clears throat> I know this is a song that got overplayed on Z88, so I apologize, but I know none of you listen to Z88, so it shouldn't be a problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sidewalk, uh, it's, it's, a, it's that song, You Love Me Anyway by Sidewalk Promise. I, I cannot listen to this song without crying in the bridge part here uh, every single time, it's, it, because it's me. Where he says, I am the thorn in your crown, but you love me anyway. I am the sweat from your brow, but you love me anyway. I am the nail in your wrist, but you love me anyway. I am Judas's kiss, but you love me anyway. And this part right here, see now I am the man who yelled out from the crowd for your blood to be spilled on this earth-shaking ground. Yes, I turned away with a smile on my face, with this sin in my heart, tried to bury your grace, and then alone in the night I still call out for you, so ashamed of my life, my life, my life, but you loved me anyway. Oh God, how you loved me. It's like nothing in life that I've ever known. And it's like nothing in life that I've ever known. His forbearance. That he still offers mercy to the people who turn, who in public mock him and spit in his face. And then alone in the night when they're scared and they're afraid, they turn to him and he answers when he should turn a deaf ear to me, when he should have turned a deaf ear to me so many times. You guys, I'm probably, if you live in Merritt Island, you've seen the guy, I saw him this yesterday morning, I was driving up, and there's the old guy that holds the cross out in front of Merritt Island High, and has a scripture on it, and that guy's been doing that a long time, because he was doing it when I was in high school, and that was 20 years ago, and um, I was the kid on the bus that was like throwing things at him, and like throwing out the demon fist, and be like, Sit and save my soul. Literally, I did that. And um, to that guy, that was me. That was me. I was that that like pseudo Christian, like when in my sophomore year that had to prove to everybody I wasn't a Christian, you know. And then alone in the night when I was, I had nowhere else to go. God didn't forsake me. I cannot understand His grace and the way that he shows mercy. A real quick, slight definition that has to be given here, I think, at this point. Mercy and grace are not the same thing, right? You understand that. Uh, but they're, not only are they not the same thing, mercy is a function of grace, okay? Uh, gr grace is, a, when you show grace, when God shows grace, he's not being merciful. Grace is like this multifaceted thing. But when he's showing mercy, it is a part of his grace. If you can understand, if, if that makes sense to you, that is an important distinction there. So, fourthly, his, excuse me, forbearance. Fifthly, grace as virtue, or should I say power. Real quick, a, a handful of verses. This one, it's not so much laid out in the book of Ruth, but it is an important aspect of what grace is, of understanding the usage of the word grace. And so in 2 Corinthians 4.15, it says this, For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. And Ephesians 3, 7 and 8 says, And partakers of his promise in Christ for the gospel, which I became a minister according to the gift of grace that God has get, uh, God given to me by the effective working of his power. And then in Romans 12.3, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought. Do you see something similar between all three of those usages of the word grace? This is very important. Grace in the New Testament, one of the facets of it, is it means power. It is spiritual power. It is 
by grace, I am saying this to you, Paul would say, we need grace in our lives to operate in power. But it's not only power. It's not only spiritual power. It's also that spiritual initiative. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Paul says there, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He gives us grace and he works in us via that grace. And if you're following what I'm saying, this is an important concept. If you are lacking in initiative to do God's will, you're lacking in grace. If you're lacking in the power to speak his word, you're lacking in grace. That's why it's often used synonymously with being baptized in the Holy Spirit or being given grace. Being being filled afresh with the Holy Spirit is a dispensation of his grace. It's a function of his grace in your life. Can I tell you, the way it's used, though, is a little bit more than that. It's used in such a way that I would almost call, I would almost call grace in one of its facets like programming, like software. Like it's something that when it's downloaded into your internal system, it actually begins changing you from the inside out. It's not just power to do the will of God. It's also the unction and the desire to do the will of God. And I, I just say that because I think um, a very good thing to pray as a Christian is to ask God, God, I need grace. I need you to give me grace for this situation for the because I need power. I need um, initiative. Sixthly, gr- sixthly, it's mercy. Sixthly, grace. One of the facets of grace is mercy. It's not mercy. It, one of the facets of grace is God's mercy. This is important to notice, and we've already looked at the typology of Ruth. We already looked at the fact that that um, Malon and Boaz are both pictures of Christ. Ruth is a picture of the church, and the nearer kinsman, as we've already talked about, is a picture of the law. The guy that Boaz has to go deal with on Ruth's behalf is a picture of the law. We know that for one reason, because they get ten elders, and anywhere that you see ten in the scriptures, it becomes a picture of the law. And so they get ten elders, and they sit down, and Boaz sits down with a nearer kinsman who has a right to her, and he explains the situation. And it's interesting that the nearer kinsman is only interested in the property. He's not actually interested in the girl. And, and, and as it's been explained in the commentaries I've read, it's very, it, there's this brilliant picture there that that's how the law is. The law is not interested in, the law is not, was not made, uh, I'm sorry, man was not made for the law, but the law was made for man. Man is not, um, the law is not made, I'm sorry, the law is not interested in your humanity and in your weaknesses and in you. The law is interested in, in functions and in, in, in proper things. And so Boaz goes and deals with the law. Now there's another catch to this though. This was her responsibility. I don't know if you've known that. But in that, <clears throat> in that Jewish law, the law of the, the, the near kinsman as relates to the widow, it was her responsibility to both claims the kin both claim the kinsman, um, and well in this situation claim the kinsman and so she had to claim the first kinsman and so you guys know the story you know if, if, a, if a lady gets married to a brother and he dies the next brother in line has to marry her and then if he dies the next brother and that happened with Judah and Tamar <clears throat> and so but it was her responsibility to claim the Goel and so it was her responsibility actually according to that law to face the nearer kinsman at the gate and then when he said no to spit in his face and he would give her her shoe, and then from henceforth at the gate, he would be called the one whose shoe was loosed. <laughs> and he, he had to bear that name. But she didn't face him. And if you're following what I'm saying, there's a very important picture about the law here. Christ faced the law on your behalf. And this is one of the more important pictures in the book of Ruth of the grace of God, that Christ faced the law on your behalf. And this is very plainly laid out in the fact that Jesus lived the perfect life for you. He lived the life that you couldn't live. He not only lived the perfect life and faced the law that we could not face, he also faced the punishment of the law. He lived the perfect life, but then was judged by the law as though he had lived your life and every other sinner's life that had ever lived. He is the one who faced the law. And then seventh, 
7, grace is sacrificial. And this is important to understand. She's cursed. Deuteronomy 23.3 makes it clear that Moabites were not to come in to, if a Moabite comes into the, the nation of Israel, they could be saved. They could become a Jew, so to say, and become uh, one of God's people. But they and their next ten generations of children were not allowed to go into the temple, were not allowed to participate in the worship of Jehovah. There was this curse on the Moabites. <clears throat> And we understand that she was cursed. She was a Moabite. And this is one of the, the third great picture. There are three great pictures of God's grace in it. This is the third great one. Boaz takes her curse upon himself when he marries her. And you guys understand, that is a picture of Christ. In Galatians 3, 10 through 14, it tells us that Christ became a curse for us. As it says, everyone who is cursed, everyone who is hanged on a tree is cursed. Christ became a curse for us to redeem us from the curse of the law, that we were cursed. And the curse of the law is, if you don't keep the whole law, if you don't keep any part of the law, you're guilty of the entire law. And you can only live by it if you keep the entire thing. And so we all fall under the curse of the law. But Jesus became a curse for us, having been hung on a tree, to redeem us from the curse of the law, as Galatians says. And he lived that perfect life, as I mentioned before, so that, and then was punished for the life I lived so that I could have his perfect life. And I want to end with this truth as, as we consider that. There was, Gail Irwin tells a story, and it's, it's, it's a true story. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. When he was at Bible college some 40 or 50 years ago, um, he knew, he was friends with this one guy who was who shared a dorm with another guy. And it was an odd kind of pairing because it's a Bible college. So keep in mind, it's a Bible college, okay? So um, the one guy was kind of the, 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 the party animal. You know, he was the, the dude that was known around campus as not really being the real deal, not being a real Christian and kind of doing whatever he wanted. But then the other guy was like Mr. Perfect, you know, the guy that everybody's like, man, that's the ideal Christian. And so these guys somehow ended up in the same dorm together. Well, they were having a, a revival on campus that semester, and part of the revival is that for a week, every night of the week, they were having a, a speaker come, and he would preach the gospel, and then people could get saved. And then afterwards, they would have a bonfire, and they'd light this huge bonfire, and people could come and burn stuff that they wanted to get rid of, you know, if they if they were, had been smoking, you know, or whatever, you know, partying. They could come and burn their party dresses or whatever, and they would do that. Well, the bad boy, the the... the the, the kid who was just living it up and, and was not a Christian, he got saved at the crusade, and he had a job late at night, and he had to leave, and he couldn't. So, so basically, to make a long story short, he gets saved one night, and he wants to burn his vice in the bonfire, but he doesn't have it with him, so he's like, man, I'm going to do it the next night. So he's like, and then he realizes the next day, he's like, man, I can't, I can't do it because I've got to work tonight. And so he asks his friend, his roommate, he says, would you do me a favor? I've, I've got all these dirty magazines that I, that I've been, that I have had stored in our closet. Would you go burn them for me at the bonfire? And he's like, yeah, okay, sure, you know. And so that night the bonfire comes. This is a true story. And Mr. Perfect's <laughs> walking up to the bonfire with the box, and he trips. And the box falls out, and all the dirty magazines, like, they all slide out all over in front of everybody, and they're all like, I knew it, you know? And so Mr. Perfect is like, dude, no, no, they're not mine. They're not mine. They're Joe's, you know? And so they throw them in the fire. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't do that. He went to the cross with your sin, my sin draped around his neck, and he didn't go to the cross saying, hey, just so everybody knows, it's not mine. Not my sin. No, he became, he became my sin. In, in his grace, the, the, the sacrificial mercy of his grace, he became, he became my sin, that I might become the righteousness of God. It's, as 2 Corinthians 5 says, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace. I pray more than anything tonight, I pray for that every single young man and woman in here tonight would walk in your grace, would keep themselves in the grace of God, Lord. 
that they would fight those roots of bitterness and unbelief and selfishness and pride, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that every single man and woman in here would walk in the fullness of your grace. In Jesus' name.